Hello, my name is Francis Fukuyama. I am a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. Uh, and I'm a political scientist who's been interested in the political aspects of development. Uh, I want to talk, however, about the whole process of development and not just the political components because I think it's important to understand how they fit together. The question I want to address today is what is development? Development is a metaphor. It comes from human biology as a, a fertilized egg becomes an embryo, then a fetus, then a, a baby, and a child that grows into an adult. There's a genetic code that governs human development, but there's no such genetic code that governs human socioeconomic development. It's a much more complicated process, and I want to illustrate some of the degrees of complexity. We start with economic growth. Most people in the development field are economists because a lot of people see this as critical. Economic growth is simply increases in per capita output over time. If you look at the chart of English per capita income over uh, about an 800-year period, you see that for a very long period, uh, England was extremely flat, and then all of a sudden, beginning in the early 1800s, you get a massive increase in per person output as a result of the Industrial Revolution. I can't go into why that uh, increase happened. That's what economists study, but that governs the economic world in which we live today, and those are the aspirations of poor countries to get into that steep uh, growth pattern and get out of that flat uh, part of the curve. Uh, the problem of develop, developing countries today uh, is illustrated by the divergence that exists between uh, the developed world, which took off in that period, and many poor countries, which are today poorer than they were uh, uh, prior to the uh, impact of Western colonialism. The second dimension of development is social mobilization. Social mobilization is the rise of new uh, social groups that become conscious of, of themselves, they organize, uh, and then they enter into politics. A great deal of early social theory uh, was about this phenomenon. Uh, so the authors like Adam Smith, Henry Maine, Emile Durkheim, Max Weber, Ferdinand Tunis all wrote about the transition that Europe was going through from the late uh, uh, 18th through the early 20th century, that is to say from a small, intimate village society uh, into a big urban industrial one. In the latter society, you had pluralism, much greater diversity, the growth of individualism. You no longer lived in a village where everybody was a relative of everybody else, everybody knew everyone else, everybody did the same thing. All of a sudden, society changed, and I think that in terms of the lived experience of development, this is really the, the this is the most important uh, dimension because this is what affects uh, your relationship with your fellow uh, human beings. How are the first two dimensions connected to one another? I think the uh, person with the greatest insight on that was actually Adam Smith. The title uh, of the third chapter of his great book, The Wealth of Nations, is entitled that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. What he said, in effect, was that as markets grew as a result of better transportation and commerce, uh, all of a sudden people would stop doing the simple things like being an agricultural laborer or a peasant uh, that they used to do uh, and would all of a sudden become a uh, a blacksmith, a cobbler, uh, an industrial worker, uh, a machinist, uh, a specialist in many of the new uh, professions that opened up. And this is really what connects the two uh, dimensions of development, the first two. Uh, economic growth uh, is based on expanding markets and the application of technology uh, to production. The larger markets uh, enable the size of businesses to grow. Uh, they require more specialized labor, and that in turn leads to greater social mobilization. In a sense, Karl Marx wrote about this phenomenon when he said that the Industrial Revolution was created by a new social class, a newly mobilized social class, the bourgeoisie, that then called another new social class into uh, existence, the proletariat, uh, and argued that uh, modern um, political and economic life would be driven by the conflict between 
uh, these groups. Uh, Marx was right about the fact that social mobilization existed. He wasn't right about the final outcome of this, uh, but it is an extremely important uh, thing to remember that growth uh, is related to changes in society. The next three dimensions of development are all political. There are actually three important components of a political system, the first of which is the state. The state is a legitimate monopoly of force uh, over territory. Uh, it's really all about power. The second dimension is the rule of law. The rule of law, if it is really to be the rule of law, are rules that apply not just to ordinary people but to the most powerful people in the society. And therefore, the rule of law is a constraint on power. And so the state and rule of law, in some sense, are in tension with one another. And then finally, you have democratic accountability, which today we understand to be free and fair multi-party uh, elections uh, that force the government to respond to the interest of the whole community and not just to the interest of the elites that are running the government. And so the political system is actually a balance in which on the one hand you have a state that tries to generate and use power and on the other hand you've got a rule of law and accountability that seek to limit power, constrain it, and channel it so that it is used for purposes that are approved by the whole uh, community. And in a sense, to understand the whole of development, you've got to see how economic growth, social mobilization, uh, both interact with the three dimensions of political uh, development. So we've already seen how the first two, economic growth and social mobilization, uh, interact. Uh, many people would argue that the state and rule of law are critical for bringing about economic growth. Without property rights, which is one of the fundamental uh, characteristics of the rule of law, uh, you're not going to get investment and trade, and therefore many economists think that this is absolutely critical uh, to bringing about long-term growth. The state is also critical. If you think about a country like Haiti or Somalia or Afghanistan where there's no basic security because there's no monopoly of power, you're not going to see very much economic growth happening under those circumstances either. Uh, and I think clearly social mobilization uh, leads to demands for accountability. When new social groups uh, emerge, they're first not recognized by the political system, but that's the thing that they start demanding. Uh, and they do it really uh, through two mechanisms, through civil society, through non-governmental organizations like labor unions or workers' groups or environmental organizations and the like, uh, and they do it through political parties, which is really the way that modern democracies uh, organize uh, society so that people, ordinary people, can participate. So you've got five dimensions of development, uh, growth, uh, society, the state, rule of law, and accountability. But in addition, I think you've got a sixth dimension, which has to do with ideas about legitimacy. That is to say, what constitutes a just economic and political order? And those ideas develop on their own. They're not just an emanation of the economy, as uh, someone like Marx would have said. Ideas are very important to the legitimacy of the state. So many states have been uh, legitimated by religious uh, ritual. Uh, they're also important to social mobilization. Think about the growth of Islamic fundamentalism over the last 30 years. This comes from an idea, uh, a religious idea, that then leads to people putting on suicide vests and organizing uh, Islamist political parties. Uh, and the rule of law, I think, is rooted in the legitimacy of law. People will not obey the law fundamentally. Uh, unless they believe that it uh, represents their uh, community's interests. And finally, democracy uh, will not come about if people don't believe in the legitimacy uh, of democratic accountability. Uh, and therefore, the idea of democracy is very contagious and I think has really led to um, the spread of democracy in uh, the period over the last couple of generations. Now, to see how all of this fits together, uh, let's take the example of a real success story, which was South Korea. South Korea uh, in 1954, at the end of the Korean War, was one of the poorest countries in the world. It was poorer than the then Belgian Congo in Africa. Uh, the one thing it had going for it, though, was it had a state. It had a pretty coherent state, which was a result of its long 
historical Confucian tradition, that state was able to preside over a very rapid period of economic growth that began in the early 1960s. By the 1980s, South Korea had moved up to being something like the 20th uh, wealthiest country in the whole world. But that created a great deal of social mobilization. You had students, you had professionals, you had civil society organization, organized churches, uh, all of which led demonstrations that e eventually in 1987 led to the ouster of the strongman that was uh, the dictator of Korea, uh, Chun Doo Wan, uh, and the beginning of Korean democracy. The fact that you had democracy after 1987 then increased the legitimacy uh, of the Korean government, uh, and it also began to strengthen the rule of law because the people that wanted democracy also wanted the government to be limited by law. And so you had, in a certain sense, a very happy uh, circular flow of causality from uh, the state to economic growth to social mobilization to democracy back to legitimacy uh, and law. And as a result, Korea is now an industrialized and I think pretty successful uh, democratic society. Sometimes, however, things don't work out so well. Samuel Huntington talked about a phenomenon called political decay in which instead of starting with economic growth, you began with social mobilization, uh, with groups demanding participation in the uh, political system. And if the political system didn't open up and accommodate that participation, you'd have, uh, you'd have instability and uh, potentially chaos. And in a certain sense, that's what happened in Russia uh, over the past uh, three decades. You had a very strong state that was then weakened by, I think, a change in ideas, the legitimacy, the greater legitimacy of uh, democracy. It led to the collapse of the state. Uh, and in the slide, you can see these dotted lines uh, indicating negative uh, arrows of causality, where something actually weakens uh, one dimension of development, weakens development in one of the other boxes. And as a result, uh, Russia today is not a successful industrialized democracy like South Korea. Uh, it is a um, quasi-authoritarian uh, uh, electoral dictatorship. So this, I think, should provide a framework for people to understand the complexity of the process of development. These six boxes all represent uh, independent dimensions of development. They all interact with one another. You can have development successes in any one of these boxes. You can get economic growth. You can have greater democracy. You can have state building. Uh, and it is important if you're going to understand why things are successful uh, to understand the way that success builds on the connections between one dimension and the other. So I hope that this framework is one that you'll keep in mind as you think about specific cases of development success stories, which box that story uh, resides in, and how it's being influenced by other uh, of the dimensions of development. Thank you very much.